England's Tour of India, brought to you by ICICI Bank UK PLC. Hello and welcome to another Ray Events Cricket Conversation. In this program we have David Gower, a graceful batsman, former captain of England and thereafter a distinguished broadcaster on the game. Today his interests include conservation. Also with me is Dilip Doshi, erstwhile Indian left-arm spinner who captained Bengal and played county cricket with distinction. He's now a successful businessman. Further into the conversation, we'll be joined by a panel of cricket writers who will put their questions to the cricketers. The writers from England are Julian Geyer of AFP, Dean Wilson of The Mirror and Rory Dollard of Press Association. From India, we have Ajay Naidu, a senior cricket writer, and Indranil Basu of Sports Skida. But first, a message from ICICI Bank. Thanks Ashish and Ray Events for organizing this webinar with esteemed guest speakers. We at ICICI are very happy to be part of this event as a sponsor. As most of you would be aware of that ICC Bank is one of the leading banking and financial services institution spread across 15 countries. In fact, the consolidated uh, uh, asset size that we have is around 13.77 trillion. In the UK, we are present since 2003 and over the uh, past many years, ICC Bank UK has emerged as one of the full service commercial uh, banks servicing retail, SME and corporate clients. We are currently having seven branches spread across Midlands and London and we have a very vibrant digital channel to serve clients from the comfort of their home apart from having a iMobile and uh, uh, internet banking. In fact, we are one of the few banks in UK when the a current account can be opened digitally and in fact, uh, I'm proud to say that we are the only bank wherein an account can be opened digitally from the comfort of home in India, even before uh, you are being able to land here in UK, fully activated debit card and an account is already there before you start from India. Thanks to our digital enhancements, we also provide instant remittance to India at very competitive prices. Since we are an Indian bank and Indian diaspora is always close to our hearts, we also provide wide range of Indian banking services sitting here in UK, be it your NR account, be it your home loan account, remittance or any other servicing that you require either locally or in India without having to go back to India. So next time when you come in contact or if you have somebody who wants any kind of services uh, uh, for between UK to India corridor, please do think of us and connect with us. I'm sure uh, uh, it will be one of the very wonderful experience on the banking side. So here we go. I'll come to you first, uh, Dilip, and uh, I'd like to ask you, there's been a remarkable performance by the Indian side in Australia, where virtually a second string Indian team, inexperienced, young, defeated a full strength Australia side in Australia, and that too in a series. So what are your main takeaways from that performance? Well, the obviously what we thought was a second string team didn't believe they were second string. They wanted to believe and they wanted to prove that they were as good as anybody else who has played. And they did prove that. So I always say, come at the hour, come at the man. And uh, not only Rahane took the gauntlet of captaincy very well, and the rest of the team responded to him superbly. And I would say man for man, everybody played a stellar role in really creating history. So what happens now? You've got the regulars back. You have Virat Kohli returning as uh, captain. Do you think uh, India can sustain uh, their showing in Australia against England? Well, they would start at home as favourites, but it's only a way of phrasing it, really. To me, England are quite capable of upsetting the balance as well. But... Um, for a start, anybody, any pundit would think that you have the home advantage and uh, we've got a balanced team 
and you got the players in reserve who may not get into this team because the regulars are coming back. It augurs well for a very good series. You don't anticipate any tension coming into the side as a result of uh, people all having more or less equal claims to be in the eleven. Well, disappointment for sure. I don't think there will be any jealousy or any tension because uh, you do expect Virat Kohli to take his rightful place as a captain, as the number one batsman. You do expect Bumrah, Ishan Sharma, hopefully, and uh, Shami to come back. And uh, Jadeja will be missed. I think Ravindra Jadeja's injury is going to be a sore point. And I think the choice will be whether they play Washington Sundar or not. That is what they are going to be seeing. But I do believe that uh, the players in the bench will accept that as a very good motive. I'll come back to you uh, a little later on uh, team composition. But uh, if I may move to David, uh, first of all, a very warm welcome to you, David. And uh, you might uh, remember, I'm sure you will, because I do, I commentated on the match that the last time that England won at Chennai was when you were captain in 1985. So tell us, what do England need to do to win <laughs> at Chennai? Right. Uh, as well, <laughs> yeah, first of all, thank you very much for, for allowing me to join you all this morning, this evening, wherever you might be at the time. Um, yeah, going back to that 84-85 tour, Chennai was important to us as an England team. Um, you know, the series was won all, there's still two games to go, uh, everything to play for. And if there is a parallel between then and now, it's what I read, uh, you know, the news coming out of Chennai right at the moment, which is that the pitch might have a bit of grass on it. And of course, one of the big, huge differences uh, over the course of the last 20, 30 years in terms of Indian cricket has been the emergence of this fantastic pace attack. It now rivals the best in the world. Um, you know, Dilip knows full well that there were days where he would open the bowling uh, alongside, say, Kapil, and more of that maybe later. But, you know, nowadays they have a very strong seam attack. Um, traditionally, of course, India has always been very strong in spin. And when sides like England come to India, you're thinking it's all going to be about spin. And everyone looks at the relative uh, makeups of the teams in terms of spin. But if there is a bit of grass, if it is a battle between the two seam attacks and spin only plays a part very much later in the game, well, the game might be done. And that's exactly what happened uh, in 84-85, because we had Neil Foster, who bowled beautifully on a pitch that had a bit of bounce, a bit of carry, and he got some movement in the air and a little bit off the pitch. Um, but it was still a very good pitch, so that you know, for once it was England making 600 rather than India. Um, and that, of course, makes the difference. I mean, that is, you know, we saw that on the last tour, um, where even a score of, what was it, 477, wasn't enough uh, for England to survive one of those test matches when India gets 700. So runs are important, but you know, I think the whole balance of the contest could be very different this time. So England have strength in their seam attack. We know that. We've still got experience there. We've still got talent there. In fact, we've got a lot of talent there. So actually, you're know, narrowing it down to 11 for England uh, on, that first, you know, on that first morning is going to be interesting. Yes. In fact, uh, what I've noticed particularly about Chennai is that it's been very high scoring to start with uh, test mm -hmm. matches there. As you rightly said, uh, the last time that England played, they, India got 759 for seven or something like that. And mm -hmm. uh, a young man, Karun Nair, and we've heard very little of him uh, thereafter, uh, got uh, a 300. But ultimately, there was enough time for India to win that match. So it's been a kind of situation at Chennai, where initially lots of runs uh, are scored and then gradually perhaps uh, it becomes a turner, particularly on the final day. Would you mm. agree with that? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I mean again, you, it, I, I always find it very hard to talk about pitches when you're several thousand miles away and you can't actually look at the thing. But yes, that is the trend. Um, and even if there is a bit of grass around at the start of the game, who knows how it's going to wear over the course of four or five days. So yes, you, you know, you're always... Um, in my book, you always want to cover your bases. So you, you know, if you think it's going to be SEMA friendly for some particular, you know, it's, which sounds weird to be talking about SEMA friendly conditions on a tour of India, but if you think it's going to help them 
for the first two or three days, well, then you might have to take a gamble strengthening that department. Um, if you're, you know, there's no point in preparing for the fifth day if it's not going to come. Um, so, yeah, look back at history, take what you can from history, but it's going to be, um, you know, it's a fresh event on a fresh pitch on an old ground uh, without a crowd this time. Um, I don't know what difference that makes to a pitch, but you, know, you have a very different set of circumstances and you have two teams who have an awful lot to play for. I mean, there is that little bit of context with the World Test Championship. Um, I mean, I've seen the various permutations that would allow India to make it to the final, that maybe allow England to make it to the final. If they don't come up, Australia can still make it. So, I mean, there is still that challenge. But primarily, when you start a, a bilateral series like this, it is all about two teams wanting to come first. And it's as simple as that. So with uh, a little bit of a question mark as to whether Ben Stokes will be able to bowl, what mm -hmm. would your attack be? Um, well, looking at the evidence that England has from the last month, from the two test matches in Sri Lanka, it's still very evident that the two best bowlers are Broad and Anderson. Um, they shared the duties, um, but if you're looking to get an advantage in the first test of a series, which is the obvious thing to do, you pick your best players. So I would expect and hope that Broad and Anderson are in that team. You've got Archer, who's been resting, um, who has that wow factor that we've all seen, and you will have seen in India, or those, you know, those that are keen fans of cricket in India and watching India a lot will see everything that Archer has done, for instance, in IPL. Um, but obviously, for England's, from England's point of view in test matches, he has the strike factor. You know, he is the strike man. So if you put those three in to start with, you've got a very strong team attack. Um, and you've got a nice, a nice bit of variation too. With Archer's extreme pace, if he slips himself, with Anderson's ability to manipulate a ball, with Broad's persistence and um, you know, canniness, then you've got three very, very good seamers there. Stokes can add a couple of overs in as well. And I'm not quite sure about his exact fitness in that department at the moment. Well, that's fine. And then you sort of tweak around with the spinners. But I think those three will be absolutely key. And if you're looking to gain an advantage, as you surely must at the start of a series, then you'd play your best bowlers. So then uh, are you talking about two spinners over and above uh, three specialist uh, fast well, bowlers? It depends. Uh, you could do. I mean, I, you know, I obviously, you know, going back in history, 84-5, we had two spinners. And they were very much part of my plan, my game plan for that series. And they both did a great job. So, I, yeah, I do like the idea of two spinners. But England have the opportunity, uh, I suppose, you, mean, you, can, you, can, you can stick them in, but then you rely on that top order being efficient. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, me pick up, uh, let me pick up on what you said a little while ago. This is, after all, being played for the World Test Championship, and it matters. Mm -hmm. And, and therefore, the rotation policy that England have adopted, is it the right one? Because England, if I'm not mistaken, uh, have to win three of the four test matches in order to play the final at Lords. Yeah, I mean, for England um, to qualify for that final, they need to have an outstanding series. And as you say, you've got to win by three or four, um, which... Let's face it, you know, history tells you that uh, the odds are against that. And if you look at, you know, going back to what Dilip was saying quite rightly about the Indian side at the moment, you know, it's a very strong side with very strong backups. Um, and picking up that point, I don't think the issue of competition for places is an issue. I mean, going back again to my own experiences from the other side of that same coin, we had in 84-5, we had people like Graham Fowler there making double hundreds. Graham Gooch was, not, was, was banned at the time. But when we got back to the UK for the following summer, Graham Gooch is the better player and Graham Fowler had to make way. And, you know, both understood that. You know, Graham's, Graham Gooch was slightly embarrassed, but got runs. He was, knew he was important. Graham Fowler was slightly miffed, but understood that Graham Gooch is the better player. So you have pressure for places, which is never a bad thing. Um, you have the spirit that comes from winning. And, of course, you have the absolute incentive. But forget the World Test Championship for a moment now. You have the absolute incentive that this is as historic a series now as any. India-England is one of the, flag, you know, the flagstaff series. It is a, it's an immense series, wherever you are. And whether you're in India now or back in England in the coming summer, you know, it's a box office series. So you want to try and win it. So I mean, I'm, I'm slightly, as a test fan, I'm slightly annoyed that England have you know, already made plans, for instance, allowing Butler just the one test match 
you're the first test match to this series, which is great for Ben Folkes because he's a very, very fine keeper and will no doubt get a chance in the next three. Um, but Besto found form in Sri Lanka, rested. Um, and it's, I mean, it's fascinating. It's, it's very hard to understand nowadays sort of the very different influences on selectors, team management, captains, when you're trying to balance the needs of a test side against a white ball side, um, and of course, throw into the mix these bubbles, which of course you shouldn't overlook because these are very, very testing times for all these players, um, both being away from home and both being, and also being cooped up either in a room as they have been for the last week, or you know, the first week in India, or in a you know, eco bubble, so-called eco bubble in a hotel. It's, you know, it's a very strange way of doing things, which you shouldn't underestimate, I think, the effect that it has on, on players. So all these things have to be balanced out. But I mean, just as a, you know, an Englishman wanting England to do well in this series, you kind of want you know, the best players to be available for as much of it as possible. Absolutely. To come back to you, Dilip. So, um, the Indian team composition, would you go for three spin bowlers or three fast bowlers in your sort of five-man attack? I would go for three fast bowlers and two spin bowlers, especially in Chennai. Uh, because uh, as I understand and I read that the new groundsman has promised that he's going to make a sporting and cricketing wicket that is uh, fair to the entire game. So reading between the lines, and the pitch is probably newly laid as a new uh, workman has come into place. Um, I would say that he's got to make sure it is bound together and there'll be some grass, as I am given to understand. And going back on what David was saying, adding further to it, I'm also amazed that Butler would have to leave after the first test. And just for the sake of understanding, if he gets 100 in this test and England do well, do you still allow him to go back? And when Bairstow was doing well in Sri Lanka, why is he rested? But of course, these are the questions which both David and I cannot answer because I still believe your best team or your best foot forward has always got to be taken. Coming yes. back to the Indian team composition, I would say that uh, Bumra and Shami are the spearhead of the attack. If you have to play three spinners, then but, you will uh, play... By the way, Shami is not in the squad uh, to start with. So he's not playing in this test match. There's a choice between, uh, I would imagine, uh, Bumrah as leader of attack and uh, Ishan. either Ishan Sharma, Ishan Sharma. and uh, Mahmoud Shami. Uh, or yeah. Mahmoud Shami. Mahmoud Shami. Sirah. Mahmoud Sirah. Sirah. Yeah. Sirah. Or one of the two. So I would say that Siraj is sure to play along with Bumrah. And if Vishant is fit, he could play. And then you have Ashwin, of course. And how do you drop Washington Sundar uh, when Jadeja is not available, who will be sorely missed in my view. And uh, Sundar has to play in my view, unless they are going to take gamble of introducing Kuldeep Yadav with his Chinaman Googly. And... Um, if they do that in the first test of the series, it will be a sort of a gamble. So you would still prefer three fast bowlers and two spinners rather than three? Because in the past, by the way, uh, in fact, the last time that England played in Chennai, uh, India played three spinners uh, as opposed to uh, three fast bowlers. Yeah, you see Jadeja was there, Ashwin was there. And I think Jayant the other was playing, if I'm not mistaken. But now in this case, Sundar will play as an all-rounder because he bowls off spin and he batted extremely usefully in Australia. Ashwin walks into the team as the best spin bowler. And they have to decide whether they want to take a chance with Kuldeep. And of course, don't forget that there is another left-hand spinner come uh, batsman, you know, who is more from T20 and ODI mold, Akshar Patel. And there is a talk that he might also be playing. So not knowing the pitch as from thousands of miles away, I would say the choice lies between Sundar and the other spinner. So uh, what you're saying is that six batsmen, and that would include uh, the wicketkeeper Rishab uh, yes. Pant, rather Pant. than uh, Hardik uh, Pandya at uh, number six, uh, and then the well, five bowlers. Well, with Hardik Pandya, I would have played him 
had he actually been fit to bowl 10 to 15 overs in an innings. And I think there is a question mark about his fitness in bowling. So this only the team that is close to the scene can take a decision. But Hardik is a good cricketer. At some stage, I won't be surprised if he is introduced in the Test Series. David, uh, based on India's performance in Australia, the Indian top order seems to be quite settled. You've got uh, Rohit uh, Sharma with his experience and you've got this very talented young man, Shubman uh, Gill. And compared to that, the England top order in Indian conditions, uh, it, would you say it is as good or as stable? Not yet. Um, the England top order, let's face it, you know, Burns has been around for a couple of years and has had his ups and downs, but is a steady player. Um, he's not one of the greats. He's a steady player. The other two, the interesting one, or well, the interesting two for me are Sibley and Crawley, because Crawley, I know, I mean, I've spoken to Crawley. I mean, I don't know Dominic Sibley in particular, but I've spoken to Crawley, oh. and I know that he has a very steady mind, a very steady rock-like uh, determination to do well. He works mighty hard. And that double hundred he made in the summer included um, some very aggressive batting against spin. Now, he's had a bit of a, a shocker in Sri Lanka. He knows that, we know that, India know that. Um, it might actually help that, you know, in an ironic way, that uh, you know, if Seam is going to be more part of the series, certainly at the start like this, well, actually, that might settle him down a bit. Um, but at the same time, if you're facing, say, Jasper Bumrah at the start of a game and there's a brand new ball and a tinge of green, well, even that's a, a mighty big test for an experienced batsman of 10, 15 years test cricket. So, I mean, the top order is less experienced. Well, I say that. I mean, Shubman Gill has only just started his career, but he started it remarkably well. So um, one of the things that's key to any batsman, whether he's 21 years old or 41 years old or somewhere in between, is form and confidence. Confidence you cannot bottle. If you've got it, you start an innings thinking you're going to do well. If you're short of confidence, then you know that those first 20, 30, 40 minutes are absolutely vital. And you just change your attitude to hang in there. But if you're, if you're playing well, the game is always easier um, because your confidence is higher and things just flow from that. So I mean, the thing about that top three, because that's potentially the top three for England, is that they'll be in India for the first time. Um, they won't have that thing which we've all experienced before, which is you know, the atmosphere of a crowd at wherever it might be, whether it's Chennai, Mumbai, Kolkata, wherever it might be. Um, you know, an Indian crowd has that very special atmosphere. So they won't have that, um, but they will have all the usual things that are applicable to playing in India. And they are playing, again, to make the point, a very strong Indian side, which should be full of confidence because of the way it's played in the last couple of months. So there's all the normal pressure of starting a test series. You wake up on the morning, you know, Friday morning, you wake up, you know you've got a couple of hours before this game starts. Um, there are nerves jangling. You want to do well. You've got all the usual apprehensions that come with being a player in a test match at the start of a series. And it's, you know, who copes with that best at the end of it all that comes out on top. So, you know, there's nothing, I, I think, just to, to sort of summarise, I think Crawley is probably the most talented of those three. I think Sibley has a determination and a way of making things work, as we saw right at the end of that series in Sri Lanka. And Burns, again, you wouldn't recommend playing like Burns to anyone in the world you know, under the age of 20. But he has made that work for himself. And, you know, again, the, what are the attributes you need to be successful? Well, a bit of talent comes in handy, of course, but a lot of determination um, is, of course, a, you know, a vital ingredient. So... Um... Oli Pope did well in South Africa last winter. Do you see any room for him in the 11? Just, maybe. It depends on how many bowlers they need to pick. A little bit depends on Stokes and his fitness, uh, overall fitness. Uh, and Pope himself, of course, is coming back from that recurrent shoulder injury, which has meant that he couldn't really be effective in the field for the last year or so now. Um, but Pope is very, very talented. And watching him in South Africa, I was down there for the Cape Town Test match that started last year. And when you watch him live, when you watch him on TV, we can sort of look into his eyes a bit. There is a young man there with huge talent. Um, he enjoys himself out on the field. He likes a challenge too. So, I mean, he's got, he seems to have, and people have said this of him for years now, since he was a teenager, he has got the temperament that you know, should see him through many, many years of Test match cricket. But of course, coming back into a side after a, 
a year out with injury and the rest of it, again, you have a sort of different set of anxieties. You know, you know other people have been in that place. You know that you, you're worried, for instance, that you haven't been in that side for a year or so. Um, therefore, you want to make an impact as soon as you come back in. I mean, he is talented. He is good enough. Um, and it's just a question really on the balance of the team, I think, as to whether or not he comes in at, at number six, say. I remember, uh, Dilip, you used to say in your uh, heydays that uh, you didn't mind bowling on a green top because you felt that you could uh, kind of fizz the ball even on a green pitch. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I think normally a green pitch that has got a little bit of juice, which helped the seamer, is due to the moisture. So it depends on the way you hold the seam and you bowl. But the only time I've got 10 wickets in a certain good level of cricket is while playing for Northumberland against Durham on a green top and I had to open the bowling. So I remember that one can spin the ball, but uh, it's a bit of a challenge. I would say that uh, adding to what David was saying was that uh, much will depend on the composition of the team. And uh, Ashwin is one of those bowlers who could bowl on a green top as well because he's quite happy to vary the flight, the pace of the ball, and chain the line. So, uh, one question, which is more a comparison. Uh, do you think that today's generation of batsmen uh, are not as good against spin as they used to be in your time? Well, I often say that the modern game is dictated by what they do in the T20s, and the muscle memory is built on playing shots. And they carry this confidence into the test match. And that's the reason why you see almost a result in every test game these days. And the art of negotiating spin bowling, which David was extremely superb at, and Keith Fletcher and a lot of other English players, Graham Gooch, many great players I can talk about. They were adept at using the conditions to their advantage. They were not looking to blast each and every ball. They would negotiate that the ones and the twos, the odd four, and the frustrating the bowler. These days, the bowlers have a better chance because the batsman is not willing to be kept quiet. And I believe that the runs are like supply of oxygen. If you can squeeze the batsman for a while, he's got to find some way to play shots. So there is a little bit of difference that the quality of batsmanship I feel, and this is not as an old timer, David might agree, but the way of negotiating spin bowling is way different to what used to be when we played earlier, when I saw many great players of spin bowling as well. And one uh, last point, uh, uh, David, uh, which is this, that I noticed uh, Broad in particular was bowling leg cutters. Uh, so in subcontinental conditions, do you think that's uh, the way to go rather than uh, uh, swing the ball because it may not swing that much? Um, well, again, I, th I think the, the important thing here is not to make generalizations because in Sri Lanka, they played on a pitch in Gaul there, on two separate pitches in Gaul. Where, and we know what Gaul does. You know, it's going to turn. It turns early. It carries on turning. And it never stops turning. And there's no pace in the pitch for any of them. So Broad has, over the years, you know, he used to be an out-and-out -out seam bowler. Um, over the years, he's acquired the experience to bowl on pitches that don't help him do his normal things. So he's developed those cutters. And if that's what's needed, I mean, for instance, Chennai, you might well find, who knows, you might well find that at the start of the game, first couple of days, it goes through so you bowl as it were normally. If, say, by day four, the pitch has flattened out and died down, as a seam bowler, you know, someone like Broad could then bowl his cutters. It's whatever you need at that moment to suit the circumstances. And you know, that, is, that is what you have to do. Wherever you go in the world, you have to adapt to what's in front of you. So, I mean, I think nowadays, I mean, the, again, we're talking, we're all talking with experience of what it might, what, 20, 30, 40 years of watching or playing or both cricket in India, and things have changed. Um, I look at the pitches in IPL, uh, some of those pitches. You look at them, and I'm watching from you know, the comfort of a sofa in Hampshire sometimes, thinking that's not an Indian pitch. If it's moved by Indians, for instance, the ball's flying through. Well, that's a, it's a very, very good pitch. It's a different sort of pitch. So it's, you know, some of the pitches that Dilip used to bowl on, you, know, you wouldn't get the ball as a seamer to bounce more than stump high. I, mean, I remember playing at places like Kanpur, where 
if you were Capel or someone like that, you thought, well, I'd, he'd, he'd rather be in a completely different state because that pitch didn't bounce above stump high. We had people like Grand Dilly, who was at the time one of the quickest in the world, bending his back as hard as he could. And there's people like, say, Sonny, you know, uh, my great friend, you know, our, our great friend, Son of Gavaska, who is standing there playing at waist high. Um, those pitches are gone. I mean, those, those are, that, that's, that's historical. That's, you know, that's all part of you know, almost myth and legend now. So it's whatever comes up in front of us or in front of them Friday morning is going to be the key. And I think there's going to be some... Excellent points. Let me ask everyone to unmute yourselves. And uh, I will come to Indranil Basu of Sports Kida first for your questions, please. So my first question is, of course, to Dilip Doshi, sir. So uh, what's the best way to attack the England batsman? Is it the spin or the pace? And and the same question to uh, uh, David, sir. Uh, what's the best? Are the Indians uh, very good against pace? We have seen what they did in Australia. Uh, are they are they are they are they the best way to attack them? Is this is is with spin? What we saw in 2012, uh, Monty Panesar and company. So what are your thoughts, David? Uh, yeah, I'll go first if you like. I think the right. The, okay, going back to basics. Wherever you are, whatever's up against you. You want your best players to be in a team, and England's best team includes people like Broad and Anderson and Archer. So if they get anything that is helpful to them, there will be a handful for India, Australia. It doesn't matter who they're playing against. So India know they will have a challenge on their hands facing that attack, especially, as I say, if there's a little bit of something in the pitch for them. But, again, going back to the point of confidence, if you've just come through a tour of Australia, and that's a very good Australian attack they have as well, and you've won in Australia, against Australia, against the likes of Cummins and Hazelwood and the rest of it, well, um, I mean, who's the best example? Rahani, hundreds, uh, Pajara, you know, taking blows to the body. You know, they have the skills needed to blunt the attack. But on their day, you know, you know what cricket's like. Cricket is all about taking the moment, seizing the moment. If on day one, if on Friday morning in Chennai, for instance, for the sake of argument, Anderson and Broad are let loose and they pick up three quick wickets, that sort of thing, you're up and running and you're in the contest. If at the end of that morning session, it's 60 for none, different game. So the, you know, the, these, this is what makes it interesting, exciting and unpredictable. I mean, we can do our best to, you know, to sit here and predict what might or might not happen. Um, but you've, you know, I've, I've got to say that you know, as long as England pick their best attack, you know, they will be competitive. Dilip? Yes. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I think to answer Indranil's question, really, um, there is no particular way you can uh, attack the English team. Um, your best bowlers have to be on front. And as David was saying that uh, all the good bowlers like Anderson and um, Stuart Broad, I think they are world-class bowlers and they will adapt to any conditions and uh, they will make a go at anything, and they will believe that they will take a wicket any time. This makes them very threatening. Similarly, when India is bowling, Jaspreet Bumrah, Mamad Sira, the young boy, who also looked like taking a wicket most of the times in Australia, or Ashwin, they will be looking to take wickets. So I think there is no fixed plan. You cannot decide earlier what you're going to do. You're going to take it as it comes. But I think it's going to be a very, very well-fought series. And as David was saying, the first day of the series will be an extremely important to set the pattern in a way, so to say. So which is, which is the, uh, if I, if I uh, can ask one more question, which is the most sought after series in world cricket? Is it the Ashes? Is it India, Australia? Or is it India, England? Okay, it's a perception, <laughs> to be very honest. To be a very honest perception. Uh, I believe... England, Australia, Ashes has been there for more than 100 years. Yes. So any cricket lover who grew up in India or wherever, like we did, we look forward to hearing the commentary then. And I still follow Ashes as closely as I would do anything else. So it's a question of perception. Since India has come of age in cricket in the last 30, 40 years, uh, India, Australia series also have been very enchanting. And it depends on the two given sides at the moment. And I think England, India is as good a series as any you can get in the any time of history and probably with the two current sides. 
So I would say it's a perception and a lover of cricket would enjoy any series. Would you like to add to that, David? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think the, you know, something like the Ashes um, always has that one thing going for it, which is a long, long history. And there is a sort of, a sort of personal enmity, if you like, or a national enmity, which fuels it. But if you look at the way cricket develops, you go back to the 80s. What was the strongest side? Which was the strongest side in the world? It was the West Indies by a distance. So if we were playing Ashes series, we had the history. We said, yes, let's win the Ashes. If we were playing the West Indies, we're saying, well, it won't be long. It'll be over soon. We'll have lost it and we can move on and play the Ashes and get some kudos back. Nowadays, as uh, Dilip so rightly says, India has a very strong side. Um, a side that, for instance, okay, here's another big difference over the last 20, 30 years. If India used to go to Australia, you knew there was one result. That was it. If India came to England, there was likely to be one result. If England went to India, it went the other way. You could almost predict because of the advantages of, of being the home team and the relative strengths and the relative techniques, you could almost predict straight away what the result of those series would be. Nowadays, you have India, and it's not the first time, as we well know, India winning in Australia, which used to be unheard of. You have India coming to England, being very competitive. Um, you have England thinking they're competitive in India, but of course, over the next four games, we'll find out how competitive they are. Um, so the balance has changed around the world. And I mean, those are, and you, and you mustn't forget New Zealand, because New Zealand, let's face it, are already booked in that World Test Championship final. And they have made absolutely the most of limited, relatively limited resources. So you've got basically, you know, those four sides which are competing for the, for that berth, uh, for the final, for that World Cup, World Test final. And the, the series between them, each and every series between them is important. Absolutely right. So up next, uh, Julian Geyer of uh, AFP. Um, a question for both David and Dilip. Um, Joe Root's about to play his 100th test and join David in a fairly exclusive England club. I just wondered what both of your thoughts were on his career and his, and, and his position as England captain in his form at the moment. Uh, shall I go? Yes. Um, well, first of all, if you look at Joe's figures, he is the most successful of all of us who have reached that 100 test mark in terms of his figures right now compared to Boycott, Peterson, Cook. You know, he is ahead of the game. He's got more runs now than any of us had playing our 100th test match. Um, he's a super player. I mean, what he did in Sri Lanka was outstanding. Um, and, of course, the thing is he knows that he needs to carry on that form because... We, without it in Sri Lanka, you might well have come second anyway. So he obviously, as any captain, always wishes. He wants to set the example. He wants to lead from the front. And he's eminently capable of doing that. Um, in terms of what happens to the rest of his career, this is just, you know, we always make a fuss about hundreds, whether it's an actual hundred in an innings, someone reaching a hundred test matches, all the landmarks in the game, 8,000 runs, that sort of stuff. You know, they're all landmarks, which... If you're someone like Joe Root, you sort of look at it, smile quietly and say, yeah, that's nice. And you crack on, and you start playing. And you, you, you know very, very well that the business actually is about getting the right result from the game starting on Friday morning, getting the right result from yourself as a player. And each and every captain that has ever lived in this game knows that it's far easier and far better if you're doing your job as a player well, as well as trying to captain. I mean, his, his captaincy is, is good. Um, you, know, you don't make a final judgment normally on a captain until they've you know, long since finished playing. But by and large, he has, as everyone again has to do, you know, learnt on the job. You don't get the chance to be the perfect captain from day one. So you're gaining experience each and every minute you're captaining a side. And he's come on well. I mean, and of course, it helps when you're winning games and it helps when you're making runs. The lip. Yeah. Uh, Joe Root is an outstanding player of any era, in my view, and he is easily one of the few best. Maybe in this series, it will be also Root versus Kohli, sort of supremacy as a captain and as a batsman, in my view. Kane Williamson is an outstanding player as well, along with Steve Smith. So Joe Root has always impressed me. In between, he had a little bit of dull spell, but he has come back very strong, even stronger. And what I like about the game that he plays is he brings also inventive and unorthodoxy in his batting. 
he sweeps the spinners in front and late, which is a great advantage for a spinner. Being a spinner, I can tell you, if people have the various ways of playing you, you're always going to think how next to bowl to him. So Joe Root is going to play an extremely important role in this series. He has been one of the great players of our times. And uh, he has also been very good as a captain. As I can see some effervescence, a little youthfulness in him, in his steps, and the way he speaks to his colleagues, even when the going is not good. So I think there's a lot of time we all have for Joe Root, really. Mm. Thank you very much. Us, we have with us uh, Dean Wilson of The Mirror. Uh, Dean, your points, please. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, hi guys. Um, interesting stuff. My question really is actually about one specific player and how he might uh, make an impact. Ben Stokes is returning to the side for the first time this year. Um, it's a huge year uh, of cricket um, across the formats, but certainly in test cricket. What do the panel think um, he brings, um, in particular somewhere like India, where he's obviously got quite a lot of experience now. Um, he's got a lot of experience in the game, full stop. So I just wonder what your expectations of Ben Stokes might be for this series. Uh, well, from my point of view, Ben is one of those people. Uh, Dino, you and I know someone called, what's his name again? It's not slightly B. Um, <laughs> uh, he's, he's Baron, Baron something or other. Baron Beefy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we know the Baron. And we've known him between us for about 100 years. And... That sort of character in any test team gives that sort of X factor, again, to use that expression. You've got someone there who believes they're going to win at all times. It's an infectious thing, an infectious spirit that spreads to address you. So someone like Stokes has that. He's obviously got the ability, and as we now know, he's gained a lot of experience last five years or so. His game is much more rounded than it used to be. So he has a pivotal role to play. I'd say I'm not quite sure how fit he is to... Uh, to bowl. Um, you know, I think in, in general terms, England use him sparingly now anyway, even when he is fit. But as a batsman now uh, at, say, number five, he is potentially vital. Um, he plays spin well enough. He plays pace very well. Um, but it's like any other player in the world, including both of them. You know, if you're on a roll and going well, you are not just a vital cog, but you're a successful vital cog. If you're that vital cog and things are going against you. Well, like every other player in the world, you have to sort of learn how to deal with it. But when you've got Ben Stokes in your middle order, you immediately feel that you are a stronger team. And that's a very good starting point. Dilip? Uh, yes. Uh, to me, Ben Stokes is an absolutely easily the best cricketer in the world today. Best all-rounder in my view. I do not know about his bowling fitness, but he brings a lot of energy to his batting. And he is not afraid to play his shots, which will be very useful against the Indian spinners. And uh, to me, he is going to play along with Root, a stellar role for England in this series. And now don't forget that with the IPL being played regularly, all the England cricketers are very much used to the Indian conditions. And in IPL, you have seen some ranked turners as well, as well as very quick pitches as David saw it. And all these things will certainly help the England team to feel confident about this series in India. Then looking at Ben Stokes, I've seen that he has also assumed the mantle of being the most responsible batsman at times when England needed. So he's curved his natural instincts to play shots and he has also developed an impeccable defense of late. So I really feel that Stokes is gonna play a huge role. He's a wholehearted cricketer, very much in the same mold as our dear old friend Ian Botham, BC. I would say that uh, that's a great compliment to pay to anybody. Rory, if I may come to you now. Rory Dollard of uh, Press Association. Thank you. Uh, David, what, one for you, if possible. Um, mm -hmm. You were obviously uh, synonymous, really, with, with Sky and their, their coverage of English Test cricket, particularly overseas, for many, many years. I just wonder, now looking at the prospect of uh, Channel 4, returning to the to the fray really for this series and as you mentioned right at the start of the call about life in lockdown being quite 
uh, a challenge. I just wonder if you think this is a good time or a, an apt time for the game to come back to free to air and how you see that. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, well, it is. Okay, the easy answer to that is that it's all about you know, free competition, and it has always been about the highest bidder. And up until now, uh, on for most of the last what is it, twenty years, give or take, in broad in the broadest of terms, Sky has been the highest bidder. And all right, as a former Sky man, um, I am not honour bound to defend them as such, but they have paid for the privilege to cover cricket. They've done it extraordinarily well, and they continue to do so. I mean, I'm I'm sort of slightly miffed because I'm not there anymore. I mean, I'd love to be part of it. I'd love to be part of what's going on over the next few weeks as well. And I've sort of thrown my hat into the ring, certainly for BCCI TV, uh, you know, for Star in, uh, in India to see if they'd like a bit of experience, knowledge, and someone who can speak English. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, and I think, you know, I personally think there's a lot to add there, but Channel 4 have, have won the bid. Um, I know from the logistics of it, they will take the feed, they will take that live feed from India, and all they have to do with Channel 4 is add someone into a studio, which sounds like it's going to be Strauss and Cook uh, and Rishi Pasod, I think, is the man who's going to be linking it all together. So, they are, yeah, they're bringing cricket um, to the UK on free to wear. We saw with that World Cup final that uh, when Sky made the gesture there, despite having the rights, the exclusive rights, they agreed to let uh, Channel 4 air that at the same time. And, of course, the audience goes up uh, automatically. But it's always been this. It's always been the argument. Do you want £200 million to spend on the game? Or do you want a substantially smaller sum and have an extra million people watching the game, which is the greatest benefit? And it's one of those ones that you can have as many pints as you like in any pub when they open in about five years' time, and you'll still be debating that. Um, because, I mean, I would, I would argue this on behalf of, not Sky specifically, but on behalf of the ECB, for instance. They have always said that the money they've got from TV rights has allowed them, for instance, to spend money on the recreational game. So working their way up from the recreational game, uh, the women's game, of course, has come on leaps and bounds in the last decade or so uh, because there have been more resources available to spend on them as well. And they have benefited hugely from that. So women's cricket around the world is coming on. But for instance, just being parochial and talking about ECB, they've always gone with the argument they've had money to spend to develop the game. And that's been as important as people actually sitting in front of their TVs watching it. Because there are so many different ways you can actually keep in touch with it. And one of, one of, the, sort of, the, one of the nice little things that Sky's PR team used to come up with was that, for instance, throughout Monty Panasar's career, of course, Monty was um, you know, a role model. He was a sort of an, an icon. He was a, you know, Monty was Monty. Throughout his career, he never appeared on terrestrial TV. And yet his reputation was allowed to build. So there are definitely ways you can keep in touch with any game, even without terrestrial television, but you're know, good for Channel 4 to have, to have won the right. Rory, I don't know what your information is, but uh, I gather that uh, the rights awarded to Channel 4 are not exclusive. And therefore, yes. I would imagine that Sky could also be in the picture. Just, just wanted David to talk around the issue there. That was perfect. That was ideal. Thank yeah, cool. you. Yeah, okay. And do you have a question for Dilip? Yeah, I wonder, Dilip, if you have seen uh, much of Jack Leach and, and how you feel he is going about the business of being a, a left arm spinner in Test cricket. I've seen enough of Jack Leach recently, and uh, I think he's improved game by game. In the second inning of Sri Lanka, also, I saw that he bowls on the wicket. The whole idea is to make the batsman play at every ball. And these days with the DRS, people will feel very uneasy to pad up. And that's one of the key things which he has adopted. I think he is also developing the temperament of being a good spin bowler. So good because if you get a tap, if you get hit, you don't have to lose your nerves. You still have to go about doing the job. And uh, I saw him using the crease uh, Varyingly, so he's going to bring different angles to the spin bowling. So I think uh, he will become an important bowler in this series as long as he keeps his nerves. And uh, similarly, I must add here that uh, I don't know, David, if you agree, but Moin Ali has always troubled the Indian batsmen in the last few series that we have seen. And um, because Moin bats as well, whether he would be in the content for the place in the team, I'm not sure. 
And uh, at the same time, England have a nice problem because Dom Bess has also bowled extremely well, uh, given the circumstances that were in Sri Lanka helpful, but he still made the most of it. So he still bowls like a classic off spinner, but I would love to see him bowl a little bit round the wicket on turning pitches to create a blind spot and an angle, which will help him um, create a little confusion in the minds of the Indian batsmen. So I think overall England are in a good hands at the moment. David, yeah, uh, okay. who would be your spinners? That's the first very mine. Yeah, I, spinners well, in in the in say the eleven. If if let's say two spinners play in the final eleven, probably Bess and Leach because they've been playing. Um, I mean, I'm a great believer that spin is not an easy art. We saw even just in two test matches in Sri Lanka how both of them were a bit rusty, not surprisingly, at the start of that series. By the end of the second test in Gaul, there's a bit more rhythm. And I worry that Moeen has been both out of the team and you know, he's been unwell. He's now fit again, yes, but I just worry that he hasn't really had a chance to get himself going. Because if you're, if you're bowling against you know, Kohli, Pajara, Rahani... You know, this very, very good Indian batting lineup. If you're playing against good players on, on their home territory, you need to be bowling well yourself. So I think you know, overs under the belt are probably quite handy. And I think, therefore, it's possible that Moeen will miss out um, if they can fit in both Bess and Leach. As I say, with the possibilities with the seed bowling, um, you know, the balance might just be slightly different. Who knows? Uh, but they're the ones who been, have been bowling. They're the ones who are in command at the moment. And they will have a job to do. Finally, uh, let me come to Ajay Naidu. Ajay is a senior cricket writer based in Nagpur. Uh, your questions, please, Ajay. My question is to both David and Dilip. Uh, your thoughts on India's catching. Uh, I thought in, in the recent series against Australia, it was a touch below par. Um. Well, Good, good luck. Catching? <laughs> well, well, catching is always uh, very crucial because the, if the bowler creates a chance and bowls to a plan and if he's let down, and I know that nobody does it deliberately, but it's a question of nerves. Sometimes it's a question of light in a different climate, but nobody has an excuse today. <clears throat> I would say that uh, that was one of the things. I would not expect that to be repeated again. Well, fielding is obviously very important. How do you rate England uh, as a fielding side, David? Uh, mostly pretty good. Um, they've had to make adjustments over the years, of course. As a side changes, some of your regulars, for instance, in that vital slip cordon change. But you've got people like Joe Root, who's very good catching in the slips off the seamers. And you've got Ben Stokes. Going back to Ben for a moment, one of the other things that he adds is that when the spinners are on, he is the best they've got at slip to the spinners. So that's, a, that's an addition, that's another benefit for England getting him back in the team. Um, catching, we, we know that catching can be variable um, because you know, the key catches all rely on huge skill, great reactions, and a little bit of luck. You know, if you're having one of those sessions where the ball is you know, it's hitting on the hand half an inch wrong and it just drops out instead of nestling in the palm, you, get, you lose catches at key times, you maybe lose matches. Um, I, to be honest, I wasn't watching. I, I haven't seen enough of that Australia-India series to know how many catches went down or how badly. Um, but under conditions that are familiar at home, I'd imagine they'd be, like everyone, practicing very hard and very keen to take them. But, um, it does, as we want to make a difference. Yes, and just to uh, round up, I thought I might touch on... Ahmedabad, as we know, the first two test matches will be at uh, Chennai and uh, the next two at Ahmedabad. Now, there we have this uh, new stadium, but I would imagine, Dilip, that uh, the wicket would be the same. In other words, the square is the same. Yes. The uh, pitch at Ahmedabad has generally been sporting over the years, even in the Ranji Trophy games that they've played. Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, the Ranji Trophy games also they have played. That it's been very sporting. And it has also aided the fast bowling because the soil at Ahmedabad 
the soil at Ahmedabad is red, it's hard, much like Mumbai, and probably it binds a little better than Mumbai. So I do believe that it is going to be a sporting track at Ahmedabad. David, you probably didn't play a test match at uh, Ahmedabad, correct me if I'm wrong, but you must have been there as a commentator. Yeah, uh, I've been there. We've played played other matches in Ahmedabad. We've had I've had dinner with Dilip Doshi in Ahmedabad. I'm sure <laughs> we had um, a one day international day. <laughs> yeah, uh, we were on the rooftops with your vegetarian yes. curries. Lovely, absolutely gorgeous. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't profess to have intimate knowledge of Ahmedabad's pitch as it stands. Um, I was commentating when Alistair Cook was out there. Um, and let's just let's, let's say this. The, I mean, Dilip probably knows more about it, so I'll take Dilip's word for it. You know, it'll be, it's likely to be a perfectly good pitch. Maybe slightly sporting if you're lucky, just keep it interesting. Um, and... All it means, which is very much a truism and a generalization, I grant you, and almost a cliche, in fact, it definitely is a cliche, is you know, if you start well, you have a chance. So you know, the Absolutely. first couple of days of any game set the tone. Yeah, I think taking the first steps with great confidence and establishing uh, your credentials in the first few days of the series could go a long way, in my view. I agree mm -hmm. that. So David, Dilip and cricket writers, Thank you very much indeed. England's Tour of India brought to you by ICICI Bank UK PLC.